you do. And thank you very much indeed for joining this open online briefing. And um, thank you very much to Nazim and to Vicky Doyle for constantly being there with us and giving us uh, the opportunity to, to just hear these cool sounds and also wonderful, wonderful images. Now, I'd like to invite Catherine to initiate the meeting this evening and Mahika will close it. Mahika is responsible for the whole process. We've still got people joining, but Catherine, over to you, please. Thanks so much. Happy Friday, everybody. Morning, afternoon, evening, wherever you are. It's so lovely to see you. Delighted that you're here. Um, there's a lot of news in the COVID fronts. Cases are going up, uh, new variants, things like this, but also not so much news because it doesn't seem to be in the media. Apologies, just a moment. So uh, perhaps, I, I mean, I think David will put a, new, a, a good spin on it for us. Spin is the wrong word, sorry. A good framework for us to really think about what's going on. At the same time, I want to mention, as I always do, we are recording this and it will go on to Forestie's website. And so if you have any concerns about anything that you say, please do let us know. We can edit the video and we'll make sure that it only contains the things that you want to say. Um, my apologies for my COVID puppies interrupting the uh, otherwise <laughs> seamless flow of, of this uh, OOB. David, really looking forward to hearing what you have to say. Our briefing this morning was super exciting. So I know you've been percolating. Thanks very much indeed. Hello to Ray Duncan on the top left-hand corner of my screen. Hi. I hope very much we'll be able to hear some of your views as cardiologist on what's going on with this uh, virus and what it does to endothelial cells and to small arterioles and more, uh, and the work that you, the research that you're advancing. And there are others here with a direct interest in long COVID. So quite close to Ray Duncan on my screen is Claire Rayner and very keen indeed that you will both come in together with other colleagues who are following long COVID on here. It's easiest for me to see people who are, uh, uh, who've got their videos on. So greetings to Karen Palmer, to Marianne Hasselgrave, uh, to Gawaha Atif, I've already greeted Vicky, to Ian B and to Rebecca Cantor, also to Hank Beckerdam, Jane Badham, Sarah Phillips, Kelly Fernley, Peter Hurst, Richard Longhurst, Magan Mutefa. Uh, I know that you may not uh, have find it easy to get your video on in Haveroni to add spikers currently in Vietnam and more. Nicholas Mellor, it's nice to see you here. Uh, just like to also acknowledge um, that um, Kristen Fawcett is on. Nice to see you and to note you. And um, uh, Chris Langton, thank you, uh, together with Fruzan Langdon, both of you for being here, Annie and Keith Appleyard and Courtney Morris, Auntie and Pankhurst and Bernice Wittrich. Now, what I'd like to do is to give you my relatively short account of what's going on. I uh, would also like to acknowledge that we have, from the 4SD team, our specialist in systems leadership, John Atkinson here. I'm particularly keen, John, that you come in whenever you feel like it, and I'll tell you why. This is a really interesting time, again, in this COVID pandemic, two and a half years in. What's going on? Well, I expect you're finding it almost as difficult as I am to work it out because we are remarkably short of the kind of consistently provided information that helps to make judgments about what's happening. I mean, it's much easier to make a judgment if you know that everybody who wants to act test test can get one free of charge. It's rather hard to make a judgment of what's going on if you know that the only people who are being tested are those who can afford to pay for them. It's also difficult to make judgments when you see that test positivity rates are of the order of 35%, because that immediately means that there really are many more people uh, who are positive who are not being tested. We very rarely have that degree of test positivity rate in a whole population. So we're a bit stuck on what's actually happening. We're a bit stuck on which variants are causing disease 
we've got BA4 and BA5 um, that are uh, types of the Omicron variant. And, and what's quite clear is that people are capable of getting infected with these Omicron variants when they're pretty well up to date with their vaccination against the original versions of the virus. Indeed, they seem to be able to get infected again and again with variants of Omicron. It's as though once the, the, the viruses in the Omicron family are mutating, they're quite easily able to evade the prediction provided by vaccines. And then how long does that protection last for before it really wears off? Well, it seems to be that, that, that it is wearing off super quickly in some populations. So we've got lots of variables about individual susceptibility, lots of variables about societal susceptibility that give us uh, anxiety. Fortunately, very few people who get infected at the moment are getting severely ill and dying. You seem to be more likely to get severely ill if you've not been immunized. You seem to be more likely to get severely ill if you're older and if you are suffering from diabetes or cardiovascular disease or similar. But the, the, the mortality numbers are much smaller than they were. But the long COVID potential is very much there. And uh, all of you who are studying long COVID know perfectly well that there is absolutely no rationale for referring to this as mild illness. Uh, indeed, an awful lot of people who do not get severely ill and um, um, appear to recover um, still have some residual impact of this virus in the weeks and months after infection, uh, or may, uh, even though they appear to be cured, may have a higher risk of cardiovascular or other sequelae. So quite simply, you don't really want to get COVID if you don't have to. You want to try to avoid it uh, because there is a chance you'll have long-term uh, morbidity uh, subsequently, and I don't think anybody wants it. It's also something that is truly not well understood. Now, as well as these variants that are appearing, what are the other things that we're finding around the world associated with this disease? Answer, containment and suppression of surges is possible with movement restrictions and contact tracing and isolation and so on. But all the evidence is that the strategies that have generally been used for dealing with the virus and for reducing transmission have overwhelmingly had more negative impacts on poorer people than on better off people. The gradient of impact uh, is profoundly influenced by wealth and wealth related factors. And the worst experiences are most definitely being reported by people who are poorer. Uh, and sometimes that's associated with uh, ethnicity, sometimes that's associated with occupation, uh, and sometimes it's associated with geography. Whatever it is, uh, this disease has really contributed and continues to contribute to the splits between those who are well off and those who are less well off. Indeed, COVID is thought to be one of the most important determinants of the current global cost of living crisis that is being reported in more and more locations and which has been the subject of the United Nations Secretary General's Global Crisis Response Group on Food, Energy and Finance. Of course, there are other factors coming together. It's a bit of a perfect storm of causality. As well as COVID, we've got accelerating climate change, more and more conflict, locust invasions, migration pressures uh, and uh, increased costs of energy and other essentials. But taken together, they're leading to rising food prices and, and reducing availability of finance for poor people to live. And in turn, that is leading to a really rapid and quite uh, uh, a serious increase in poverty throughout the world. And the rea reactions to this are multiple poor people are having to cope with the um, smaller amount of cash they have, 
by skimping meals for themselves and for their children, and particularly women seem to be more likely to skimp meals. Uh, there are increasing levels of food poverty, of undernutrition, even in some cases malnutrition. And the number of hot spots where there is severe malnutrition is on the increase. The number of acutely malnourished children that UNICEF is currently trying to deal with is massively increasing. Uh, in the next few days, the state of food insecurity, a report produced each year by the Food and Agriculture Organization, the World Food Programme, is going to be released. And uh, the suggestions are it's going to show quite dramatic increases in poor nutrition, uh, linked to increases in poverty, linked to the rise in cost of living, but which is very much being uh, contributed to by both the COVID pandemic and by the way in which states have responded to the COVID pandemic with actions that do seem to preferentially impact on poor people in ways that lead them to have more, be more likely to have worse health outcomes. So in these two years of response, we have seen a huge significance of good quality public health and infection control strategies. We've seen how important it is that there are good data, but also that when responding to COVID, there is partnership between authorities and people. There are well integrated responses that involve different groups in society, that systems are uh, linked together with loops that actually are responsive to need. So there are positive feedback when, when they work like that, they can be incredibly reinforcing uh, and that communities are fully engaged in the response. Now, all these are, are really uh, typical needs in good quality public health. You can't do public health without treating people as partners. Yet, so much of the response to COVID has been associated with restricting the behaviour of particular groups of people, uh, particularly when there is a rise in the number of people reported as having COVID, uh, to, uh, through that restriction, to create the sense that part of the process of dealing with COVID is to treat people as the problem and not set necessarily as the solution. This um, inability to treat people as partners and to have them as the solution providers has, we believe, had a major impact on the willingness of societies to continue to work actively to try to hold COVID back. And indeed, some of the reluctance to wear masks, some of the reluctance to distance physically, some of the reluctance to stop moving around uh, may well be a result of the pressure that's been put on people through restrictions and through controls uh, that's turned what should be a collective response into one of us versus them. And perhaps this has also reinforced the misinformation that we see around the place. We don't know for sure, but we do know that right now in public health, there is a big problem because of mistrust. What are you doing telling us that we've got to perhaps wear masks again? Say the people of France, when they hear that the Minister of Health is requesting the wearing of masks on public transport. Or, or what are you doing uh, requiring that people get vaccinated? After all, these vaccines, uh, they are uh, full, of, full of problems produced in too much of a hurry and so on. It's a big groundswell of, of anger about compulsion and about mandates. And so the rebuilding of trust so that public health can be done as it should be is an absolutely essential priority. And that leads us to asking, at least in my case, what is the relationship between uh, politics and, and the, and the acquisition of power in order to try to help make things better for people on the one hand and public health on the other? Is it really impossible to do good quality public health when you're involved in populist politics? Well, I'm not sure. But part of me thinks that some of the decisions that have to be made in public health when you ask the majority to restrict uh, what they're doing or to change their behaviours in order to provide well-being for a minority, uh, some of that requires a social contract between public health providers 
and society uh, that is, is a hard one to maintain if at the same time there's a huge wish to question the value of expertise. And so right now, my own view is that public health has to reinvent itself, has to rebuild the social contract on which it is based and has to re-earn the trust of citizens. Uh, and I believe that's possible. I don't ever think that once trust has gone, that it takes a long time to rebuild. And I'm also certain that trust is super variable. There are some communities in any society who will question public health officials. There are others who will tend to trust them. And what I am clear on is that we have to spend our time right now re-earning the trust of the populations that we seek to try to protect and, uh, and, and support. Just in the last few days, what have we had? Well, WHO called its emergency committee together and said, is monkeypox a public health emergency of international concern? And the answer is no. Right now, monkeypox outside the countries where it tends to be most often discovered, uh, it seems not to be presenting as a disease with a high risk to life. Uh, though there are many, many questions about the current monkeypox outbreak, who's at risk and what risks are they facing? What has happened though, is that in the last few days in the G20, there has been a plan developed for a new fund for pandemic preparedness, prevention and response, PPR, and the World Bank Board in the last 24 hours has approved this fund. This is quite important because it does mean that when there's a problem, there will be the possibility of accessing money quickly, which is key. Uh, WHO is making comments about the COVID crisis in Europe and saying there are going to be high levels in Europe through the summer. Uh, it's not saying mandate people to wear masks, but it is, WHO is saying that it, in, on the basis of evidence that the organization has, the, the numbers of cases uh, has tripled in the past month, incident rates are rising, what we call R0 in many countries is above one. And so this does mean we are most definitely into another surge. We had hospital admissions two weeks ago rising in Portugal, and now right now, hospital admissions linked to COVID are rising in the UK and in France and in Germany. I mean, the fact is that this is most definitely a spreading wave. The spread is also to be found in the United States and in Latin America, it's not just in Europe. The current increased incidence is associated with higher rates of absenteeism, which in turn provides additional problems for those industries which are struggling to make sure that they've got the people they need to provide the services they seek to provide. One of the areas where this is a particular challenge is in aviation. Going elsewhere, uh, mental health, Australia um, uh, uh, is in Australia, it's being reported that people on low incomes who are reported having COVID in the past are more likely to continue uh, to um, have, uh, sorry, people on low incomes who had disabilities or who are carers are less likely to recover quickly post lockdown. If that finding is repeated in multiple locations, it's further evidence that COVID for poor people is a, a, a real challenge. Um, let's just talk about vaccines that the US Food and Drug Administration has recommended COVID-19 manufacture uh, manufa vaccine manufacturers could perhaps adapt their booster shots to in include components that are tailored to combat Omicron variants BA4 and BA5. So the engineering of vaccine to suit the emergence of variants is most definitely happening. Um, I think that just to say long COVID, the reports in uh, the US uh, are about 20% of US adults who reported having COVID-19 in the past declare that they're still having symptoms of long COVID. This is about data 
survey data collected in the first two weeks of June. Um, then we've got children can experience lasting spirit in symptoms of two months after getting COVID, not getting COVID-19. According to a study in Denmark, the chances of this long COVID persistence are relatively low. Well, there's lots of stuff coming in the chat. I'd like to move now to discussion. I very much like any of you who wants to say anything to just um, put up your hand or catch my attention. I'd very much like uh, to invite Ray Duncan uh, her, to make any comments that you want to. Perhaps after you've spoken, Ray, you could pass on to Claire Rayner and then any others who want to talk about long COVID and its pathophysiology, please don't hesitate to do so. I'd like to invite those of you who are connecting from quite a long way out of Europe to, to comment. Jane Vadham, it's lovely to see you again. I presume you're in South Africa. If you'd like to talk, we'd love to hear from you. Ditto, Magan Mutefa, if you're in Botswana, which I think you are. Uh, and nice to hear from Ad Spikers, if you like, from Vietnam on what you're picking up. Be very nice to hear from people what, what they're picking up around the world, local colour. And then we'd like to go to more general comments on what we're seeing in the way of COVID for systems leadership and are we learning more and more about how to lead. Um, I'm very keen also that um, my own team just come in as you would like to. Um, and uh, um, I want to ask Chris Langdon to come in. Chris is with Live Illustration and gave us these beautiful illustrations that we've been using. We are forever grateful to you, Chris, and if ever we can do anything to help you, we will. Um, I'm hoping that Rebecca Cantor, if she feels like it, will come in and speak. I think that um, it would be nice to have a discussion with Marianne Hazelgrave on what all this is doing for women and whether or not we need to single out the challenges being faced by women, both in relation to COVID and in relation to the cost of living crisis. We certainly keep saying it, but one of the troubles is that talking about it isn't enough. It seems to be an issue that needs uh, direct and um, uh, focused action from policymakers. If you don't put women at the center of the response, then they won't be at the center of the response, I believe. Now, Vicky Doyle, love it, be lovely if you could talk about Liverpool. Now, it's easiest for me if you put your hand up when you're ready to talk, if you can got your computer working on the raise hand function. Otherwise, those who I've mentioned, please be warned that we will come to you. Ray, please. Hi there, David and Catherine. I'd just like to say thank you so much for having me on. So just to introduce myself to everybody else, I'm a cardiovascular consultant and laterally a long COVID clinical researcher in the UK based in Newcastle. I just wanted to speak very briefly about the two primary concerns that I have from a cardiovascular viewpoint about COVID. Predominantly, I'm going to talk about what's happening in the United Kingdom, but I think my comments will probably be relevant to lots of different countries. So my my two primary concerns about the new BA5 variant that is currently sweeping the UK, um, now that we have no COVID mitigations in place, um, isn't actually related to the fact that BA5 tends to be making people more acutely unwell for longer than classical Omicron, but it's more about what comes after. It's that post-COVID phase that really concerns me. And I just wanted to speak for a couple of minutes about what I believe are the two giant elephants in the room that many of our um, governments and media are not really acknowledging to the extent that perhaps, or giving as much attention as perhaps they should be or trying to prevent. So the first is long COVID, and obviously I'm involved in researching this. And the second is cardiovascular and thrombotic death and disability from COVID, which is significantly increased in everybody after infection with SARS-CoV-2 um, for at least 12 months after acute infection, whether or not you go on to develop long COVID. Um, to talk about long COVID briefly, 
And since we've removed the COVID restrictions in the United Kingdom without putting in significant mitigations like you know clean air filtration systems, masking indoors, etc., unfortunately we've seen long COVID cases rise from 1.2 million to two, over 2 million people in just a few months. Secondly, in addition to long COVID, uh, most of you in this meeting will probably be fully aware of the Nature paper. Nature is one of the best, um, most highly regarded and peer-reviewed medical journals in the world. The Nature paper, the long-term cardiovascular outcomes of COVID-19, that was published recently, looking um, published from a group in the USA, looking at over 153,000 patients infected with COVID-19 and demonstrating a significant increased risk of adverse cardiovascular and thrombotic outcomes and deaths in the 12 months after the acute COVID infection, even in the young, even in those without any cardiovascular risk factors. And those, um, those adverse cardiovascular events are include, but are not limited to acute coronary syndrome, myocardial infarction, ischemic cardiomyopathy, angina, heart failure, non-ischemic cardiomyopathy, cardiac arrest, atrial flutter, atrial fibrillation, sinus tachycardia, presumably due to post-COVID dysautonomia, ventricular arrhythmias, myocarditis, pericarditis, pulmonary embolus, deep venous thrombosis, stroke, and TIA. So there's a lot, and certainly some, there's an up to 63% increase. You may also be aware of the NACME registry data that was presented last month at the North American Angioplasty Conference. This is showing that up to a third of ST elevation myocardial infarction. So for those of you who are not medical on this call, uh, myocardial infarction is our word for heart attack and ST elevation myocardial infarction are the very big dangerous heart attacks that are like, likely to kill you or cause significant disability if you survive them. So up to a third of these STEMIs now are Manoka events. That is compared to the normal 5% that we'd expect. And what I mean by a Manoka, a Manoka is a myocardial infarction where no obstructive atherosclerotic coronary artery disease is found on emergency angiography. The, this was a finding in patients that had had recent COVID infections. This is very concerning for several reasons. First of all, it fits with the growing evidence showing that the pathophysiology of SARS-CoV-2 is that it's triggering a systemic thrombotic vasculitis, predominantly a panendothelitis, which is an inflammation of the inner lining of the blood vessels in the host, which I believe is then causing these heart attacks in the absence of atherosclerotic coronary artery disease. And if we needed any more evidence, there has been a further Nature paper published just two days ago out of a European group this time, looking at just under half a million patients infected with COVID, both hospitalized and non-hospitalized, and compared with hospitalized and non-hospitalized COVID naive controls. And they probably unsurprisingly have shown an increased incidence of cardiovascular disease and death in the hospitalized cohort compared to hospitalized controls. But also worryingly in the non-hospitalized cohort across Europe, um, there's increased cardiovascular and thrombotic adverse events as well, predominantly in the mid and late stages post-infection. And mid stages are defined as day 30 through 89, and late stages are defined, defined as um, day 90 plus. If that's not bad enough, <laughs> there's another Nature paper that's currently in preprint that you may not be aware of, but is due to be printed and published very soon. And it is looking at reinfection rates in people that have already had COVID and perhaps did not develop long COVID at that time. So it is looking at over a quarter of a million individuals who've had a first COVID infection. It is comparing them with 38,926 individuals that have had two or more COVID reinfections versus 5 million non-infected controls. And this shows conclusively and rather concerningly that reinfection with COVID causes significantly increase in all-cause mortality, hospitalization, development of long COVID symptoms, as well as additional risk of cardiovascular MACE, which is major adverse cardiac events, thrombotic and coagulation complications, as well as increased incidence of diabetes, renal, GI, neurological, musculoskeletal adverse outcomes. And unfortunately, previous vaccination is not preventing this. The authors conclude that reducing the overall burden of death and disease globally from SARS-CoV-2 
requires strategies to prevent reinfection. So just coming back for a minute to the UK, 71% of the UK population that we know of have already been infected with COVID, either Alpha, Delta or Omicron. Some have been reinfected several times already. My understanding is that current infection rates in the UK are 1 in 15 in Scotland and 1 in 21 in England, and that's in the people that are testing. If we let BA5 sweep the country without acting now, I believe we're going to see a tsunami of long COVID and cardiovascular death and disease outcomes with potentially hundreds of thousands joining the 2 million already disabled. If we're going to look at the underlying pathophysiology, there is a lot of evidence now to say, to support the hypothesis that while we don't maybe fully understand everything that's going on, but to support the hypothesis that the symptoms of long COVID are caused by the virus itself infecting and inflaming the endothelium and causing this inflammatory reaction where we get this pan endothelitis that then causes high inflammatory levels in the blood vessels, triggers our platelets and our coagulation cascade and increases our risk of clotting. Um, and the two huge elephants in the room, which are long COVID and cardiovascular disease and death are closely related cousins. It's the same pathophysiology, I believe, so my research group um, are currently running the first UK microclots trial, and this is being led by my colleague Caroline Dalton. And the data I'm going to touch on has not, not yet been published, but I am allowed to share some of it. Um, and what we have seen so far is we have looked at individuals who have symptoms of long COVID. We've looked at individuals who have COVID and have clinically recovered. And we've looked at individuals who have had not knowingly had COVID, but have had COVID vaccination. It's been very difficult to look at non-vaccinated, non-COVID infected controls, but we have managed to get that data from our colleague, Rizia Pretorius in South Africa. In South Africa, patients who had not encountered the vaccine or the virus did not have microclots. In our study, we are showing that there are microclots in everybody. However, they are much worse so far in the long COVID individuals. They tend, the burden that we've managed to, to, to quantify them, the burden of microclot formation is less in those that have clinically recovered. And what we think may be happening is that those that are unable to break down their microclots, their inflammatory reactions, are the ones that are going on to develop long COVID and their burden of microclots is higher and it's gumming up their capillary vascular beds, causing multi-organ hypoperfusion and causing the symptoms of long COVID. We're also seeing microclots in those that have been vaccinated, but to a much lesser extent. And I know you're recording this and I need to make it very clear that just because we're seeing that, I am not in any way saying that we should not be vaccinating individuals. This is just simply an observation so far. We need to understand more about it. There is a cardiologist in the UK who I'm not affiliated with and I don't know called Dr. Harrington, who has developed a risk stratification tool um, to look at the risk of adverse heart disease events based on the degree of endothelial damage and dysfunction. It's called the pulse cardiac test. Um, it uses validation of a cumulative test of 11 biomarkers to calculate cardiovascular risk. And this was validated pre-COVID. Um, a score of less than 3.5% is normal. A score of greater than 7.5% indicates a higher risk for future cardiovascular events. And the authors suggest that patients with evidence of significant endothelial dysfunction should be treated with primary preventative cardiac disease strategies in the same way we would treat individuals with high risk profiles like hypertension and uh, diabetes. Um, so in my honest opinion, for what it is worth, I think prevention is always better than cure. I think we need to act and I think we need to act now. I think given the rising infection rates, we need to reintroduce some COVID mitigations. I understand what David is saying about people's freedoms and restrictions. I'm not necessarily suggesting that, but what we do know certainly from the Danish and the, um, the Dutch groups who have recently published um, research looking at the use of air filtration systems in schools is that HEPA air filters and other air filtration systems reduce outbreaks of COVID indoors by 12 fold. So that would be a potential strategy that could be employed. In the meantime, introducing remasking, I don't think would be unreasonable. 
I also think that we need to try and risk stratify patients who have already been infected with COVID to calculate their cardiovascular risk scores. Pulse cardiac test could be a potential. I don't know that much about it. I'm just throwing it out there. If the cardiovascular risk is high, then I think we should be starting to implement primary preventative treatments, such as aspirin statins and endothelial stabilizers in the same way that we do with patients who have other traditional risk factors for cardiovascular disease. Ultimately, I think we need to act. And I think if we don't, if we do nothing, we're going to see a growing tsunami of long-term disability, cardiovascular disease and death. And on that cheery note, I'm going to stop. Ray, uh, but it's cheery, but it's also bloody, imp uh, it's slightly depressing, but it's bloody important. And, um, and I thank you very much for coming on and joining us. Uh, Ray was connected to us really because David Fedson came on one of our um, briefings and Claire Rayner connected David Fedson with Ray Duncan. And that's proved to be a very important connection. It's part of bringing together this growing community of people who have uh, uh, seen connections between endothelial damage in small blood vessels and the formation of tiny clots or micro clots which in turn lead to things not working properly between brain and body or in your lungs or in other organs and most importantly around your heart. And so it all fits together. And I, I want on behalf of all of us to thank Ray for coming along. Uh, everybody, when we get these kinds of presentations, we must be careful. They don't yet represent the consensus of knowledge. This is just work that is emerging, early results. But Ray is not on her own. There are others beginning to move the science in this direction. And um, I think that we are going to conclude that some long COVID and some post COVID does have links to this tendency for microclots to form. Ray, have I been fair in my attempts to try to place you in the wider community or would you want to change my little summation that I've just given? No, no I think that's fair enough. And I, th I think it's a very good point to say that this is still emerging research. I'm telling you what we know so far and what we believe and what the papers are showing. Um, but there's still a lot that we need to learn. And that's what we're trying to do. Thank you so much. You are absolutely mm -hmm. brilliant to have joined us. Please stay with us. These are super informal sessions uh, and um, we, we have become quite a community of people. There's about 300 people in our wider denominator, but usually it's about this number of 30 or 40 who join each time. Uh, Claire Rayner, please. Hi, uh, thank you. I think Ray said so much um, and I've emailed um, you with details of my concerns as well. Um, a couple of things I would like to say, I've never heard of or seen a virus that can reinfect people so quickly and so badly each time. It's not like you have it eight weeks before and then you get it again and it's a really mild thing. It, it, it just seems to be getting worse and closer together. I will as always say something on behalf of workers um, our healthcare workers are dropping like flies. I am really, really concerned because they are having these reinfections and complications. But my colleagues will tell me that whole um, workplaces are, are going down. You know, small businesses where 19 out of 20 people are off sick, general practices where all the reception and admin staff have caught it at once and are off sick. So the GPs were having to go onto the reception and now they've all got COVID. So my own GP practice this afternoon has just sent out a plea saying our staff are going off, please wear a mask. I'm very, very concerned. And I'm also concerned that healthcare workers and many other people who have been off sick these past two years and more are now being pretty much bullied out of their jobs. I might as well just be brief and say that very very concerned so I think those are the things I wanted to say plus I don't think this is public health's fault David I think uh, public health or the 
public health specialists in this type of thing have been pushed out by politicians and that's partly where things have gone so there's my bit. Claire, these are all really important observations. I think many of us have got friends and relatives in businesses and operate and um, um, service provider outfits where there is a lot of absenteeism. There's huge pressure on people to be not talking about this. It's as though uh, if you talk about it, you're somehow not patriotic. What they, what we all ought to be doing is behaving as though everything is recovering smoothly. But I think listening to Ray, listening to yourself and sort of being quite focused on what's happening in and around our lives, we know that it's not right. This level of illness, this level of repeating just doesn't seem to be what should be happening. Uh, it's certainly not following any playbook that I know about. So who else would like to have a word? And if you want to comment on this, um, wherever you come from, Ray, your hands up. Did you want to say no, something? No, no, I was just scratching my ear. Yeah, a very good thing to do. <laughs> Sorry, and forgive me for doing it. I'm just, uh, I wasn't really trying to be a meanie. <laughs> Henk Beckerdam in the Netherlands, former WHO person. Those of you who've been with Henk before know the kind of guy he is. He's come from WHO China, WHO India, uh, and... Um, um, he has come back to the Netherlands and he is working in the Netherlands. He must be watching this and I wonder what he's thinking. No, th 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 thank you, David, uh, but also thank you, Ray and, and Claire. I think you have been absolutely instrumental to, to bring forward the whole issue about long COVID, post COVID or whatever terminology this fair moment is. And, and I think that research, what you have been sharing is extremely important. And, and uh, I will also try to share now with uh, one of my Dutch colleagues is also in the Netherlands busy with this. I will try to share at least the names and I hope that he also can learn from this. Dave, the only thing that I would like to share also with the group that's, that's very different from this. And I don't want to put too much attention on this now because I think this issue what Ray has been sharing that needs attention now. I've been very much working on zoonosis, uh, yeah. thinking already from how we can prevent the next one to happen. And I'm happy that the Dutch government will come up with a new strategy. And our report of 160 pages has been instrumental in uh, uh, in, in this, but that perhaps another time. But really, Ray and Claire and, and, and Dave, the whole group over here, what you're doing over here is extremely important. And if you don't mind, I will share your names with my Dutch colleagues who are also working on this. Well. I mean, I think anybody who's here who wants, who doesn't want Hank to share names with um, his network in the Netherlands, please put something in the chat. As far as I'm concerned, we are all keen to connect with others who are in the same business as us. We believe that it is through connecting sideways and forming webs that we can actually contribute to the world being a better place. Thank you very much, Hank. Uh, I wanted to um, ask, I just want to check, um, sorry, I had to quite find my list. Um, uh, Marianne Hazelgrave, Karen Palmer, Vicky Doyle, Jane Badham, um, and uh, I might just call you all, if you don't want to speak, just say pass. Marianne, please. Do you want me to go first? Um, hmm. I just... If I'm, is that okay, David? Yes, of course. Yes. Okay, thank you. I just wanted to say that we need to make sure that we do keep a gender perspective as well, because when you, whatever you've been talking about, in each of the cases, or nearly all of them, women get off worse than men, mm. and girls tend to get off worse than boys. And the effects of the, I'm, I'm not talking about COVID only. Yeah. But uh, when you're looking at all the other areas that you've mentioned, uh, whether you're talking about food, a lot of the women are, are producing the, the, the food in the home in developing countries. Um, when you're talking about energy, whatever you talk about, it tends to be the women who suffer more. And we're in a sort of a, 
anti-woman climate in some ways compared with what, what it was many years ago, as can be seen by the impact of Roe versus Wade. Mm. Um, so that hopefully when the, uh, the high level polit political form, forum starts on Tuesday, and at that point, it will be possible to ensure that a gender perspective is fully included. Thank you. Very, very important. Marianne, I'm hearing that um, women um, who are getting vaccinated are finding that it, it contributes to quite a lot of menorrhagia, discomfort uh, during periods and so on. Are I've you... heard that, but I'm yeah. not a doctor. No. Okay. But the, the point is that we women are not the same as men. And mm. when you look, whichever aspect you look at, um, there it's, this sort of thing comes out much later. But there, there, I have seen that as well. And that uh, we don't actually know a lot about what is happening mm. in a lot of developing countries. Yeah. And, uh, but the, the, if I may just make one other point, this new fund you mm. were talking about, yeah. There's no money in it. A fund okay. with no money is an empty easy. shell. Thank you very much, Marianne. Another it's empty at shell. At the moment, but that yeah. it has to come from somewhere. Thank yeah. you. Thank you. Thank you, Marianne, as always. Let's go to um, Magen Motefa, who, um, are you able to talk, Magen? You don't have to turn on your camera. There's no pressure. It's just always lovely to hear what the, your news from Habarani and Botswana. Hello, David. Can you hear uh, me? Perfect. Perfect. Can you, you yes. can hear me? Yes. Yeah. Again, yes. Yeah. Yeah. Before I say anything, I just wanted to ask a question um, uh, about what Rai has said, because I was looking at what's happening in the Botswana population. Uh, people who test positive and who seek um, um, assistance, they never really get the uh, blood tests. So it's very difficult to tell whether people have inflamed vessels or whether they have inflamed lungs or whatever. So I don't know from a medical uh, perspective, can uh, patients ask for blood tests? so that uh, maybe uh, if they have long COVID is detected early, because it's really not detected. Mm. People just feel symptoms and they assume they have long COVID. And doctors uh, don't encourage people to get blood tests and scans. I think, I don't know why, they just say it's not necessary, it's not going to change much, or maybe it's the expense, I don't know. Um, that's a question to those people who are involved Ray, in come in, uh, Ray. Research. Yeah. Ray's going to answer. So, um, so I was involved in running a post-COVID cardiac complications clinic for a year. So I have the clinical side as well as some of the research that I've been doing. Um, one of the issues with the standard blood tests that are readily available is most of them come back normal. So you can have a normal CRP and still have elevated cytokines. So one of the issues we have at the minute is out with the research setting, testing for um, uh, fibrin amyloid microclots, pro-inflammatory cytokines, mm -hmm. and other markers of endothelial dysfunction is not widely available. We are mm -hmm. able to do it and we're about to start doing some more endothelial testing within a research perimeter. Um, and there, there are machines that can do it. They're not cheap, they're 25,000 pounds. Um, mm -hmm. and it's, I, I think the research isn't quite there yet. I think we need to prove it beyond a shadow of a doubt in an RCT that this, that we're going mm -hmm. down the right lines here. There's a lot of emerging evidence. I have got 10 <laughs> folders full of research papers I can share with anybody that wants to have a look at them, um, showing that, that, you know, what we're seeing is, is a thrombotic panendothelitis. Okay. Um, but there's, yeah, there's still a lot that we need to look at. So what that means, Megan, uh, is you the most of the tests that will be available in hospitals in your country and in other countries in Southern Africa, most of them will not be able to pick this up. You have to have really quite sophisticated 
special tests. But if Ray can take her work forward, and I, I mean, watching what she's doing, it's the most amazing and massive study that she's doing. When the results come through, if they show that the kind of problem she's describing is associated with long COVID, then it will be a short journey to turn that into a test that can be applied more widely. Megan, do you want to say anything else, please? Can I? Yeah, come in. Come in, right. Sorry. Right. There's one thing I could say. There are a few tests that may be helpful that are more widely available. So um, mixed venous oxygen saturations can be incredibly helpful. And you do that by taking a venous blood gas sample. Um, so it's quite simply done and it's just taken to a normal gas machine in a lab. It's not an arterial sample, it's a venous sample. Normal mixed venous oxygen saturations should be between 60 to 80 percent. In patients with long COVID, often they're much, much lower, sometimes 20 percent, 30 percent. And this is a marker demonstrating multi-organ hypoperfusion or hypoxia. Um, and that can be really quite helpful. D-dimers may be normal in patients with long COVID because mm. there is an issue with, we believe, from the research that we have so far with fibrinolysis. So um, if you have a patient who is desaturating on exertions, so getting them to do a gentle walk and looking for oxygen desaturation, for example, can be quite helpful. Um, I personally have found um, sometimes that VQ scans, ventilation perfusion scans can be helpful and maybe more helpful in certain situations than CT pulmonary angiograms if you're looking for lots of little small emboli in the lungs. Yeah. Um, and the other things that can be helpful, there's a lot of dysautonomia, which basically means the nerve supply to the autonomic nervous system can be damaged with COVID. And that can be very easily diagnosed with a, a test that costs almost nothing. And that's something called a NASA lean test. And it's mm. a 10 minute lie to stand leaning upright against a wall and checking heart rate and blood pressure every 10 minutes. Mm. And there are treatments available. So, I mean, that's one of the things you can look at. So oh, there we go. Um, what we'll do, Megan, is as Ray's work, Dr. Ray's work advances, uh, we will keep you connected with this. We think it's very important. Anything else from you, Megan? Lost you, Megan. Okay, let's move on to see um, um, Jane Badham. Are you still there? I've lost you. I'm still here, David. Uh, thank you. I've missed a couple of your meetings because, yes, uh, travel certainly seems to have commenced again, certainly within the UN. So I have been traveling. I wrote in the chat box, I was in Kenya, um, and the taxi driver said to me when I arrived, uh, duly double masked, uh, oh, madam, you don't need to worry. There's no COVID in Kenya. And on the last day of our meeting, uh, two colleagues uh, tested positive in getting their PCRs to go back uh, to their home countries. And then I've just last week come back from uh, Jordan and there there's absolutely no mask wearing. I mean, you just don't see a mask at all. I was completely uh, the outlier with, with my mask on. Um, and here and back in South Africa, also really people resuming life as normal and uh, just very scary to see, but yet hearing that we do see more cases, but exactly as you said, David, the numbers are looking so low and people are saying, oh, the numbers are low. I think yesterday, for example, it was 300 and something cases, but that's because no one's testing. Um, and as we're now in winter, as you can see by my dress, you know, a lot of people are just saying, oh, I've just got a bit of a sore throat and a, and a you know, a cough, and that's just a, the general, general co uh, you know, cold. But, uh, you know, and are, are they not masking and not isolating? And, you know, how do they know that it isn't just one of the, you know, uh, uh, isn't COVID? So, uh, yes, you know, a lot, a, a lot of difficulty still in certainly in the countries that I'm in. And often I feel that I like, as I said, the outlier, but very happy and will continue to be the outlier yes. uh, because I remain uh, not having had COVID well done. and intend to keep it that way. But well, yeah. it's frightening what we're seeing. Thank you very much, Jane. Can we go to Gawaha Atif, please? Uh, who's Egypt, from Egypt, but currently, I believe, in Canada. Go on. Hi, David. Thank you. Um, 
uh, yeah, I, I, I'm, I'm still trying to digest Ray's report. It's rather scary mm -hmm. the situ and, and concerning. Uh, uh, the situation here in Montreal is not good. Uh, there are no measures. People do wear masks uh, occasionally, the elderly. I wear masks everywhere. Unfortunately, unfortunately, there are so many people that have been infected, David, I, yeah. I, myself included. Oh, are you, have you got COVID now? Uh, I didn't it. test today and yesterday, mm. but I, I am feeling better. I'm feeling fine, but I'm still staying home until yeah. the end of the weekend. And so many people, I, I mean, it's, it's just un, unbelievable how many people I've met and I haven't met who, who've had it mm. in the last two, three weeks alone. And I don't think we have an accurate count here. Yeah. Uh, people are obviously scrambling to enjoy long weekends and traveling and as I believe somebody may have mentioned the airports or may have been in a previous call this morning the airport situation here is really bad people are grouped in very crowded spaces so I imagine the numbers will only spike mm. uh, coming into Montreal or leaving is is quite bad Toronto airport as well uh, the the systems they, they don't have staff staff are out sick um, and they had laid off people anyways earlier on in the in the in the in, mm. in the pandemic, so we we are in a in a strange situation where there are beginning to be warning signs from our public health officers at both the federal and provincial levels, but it isn't they're avoiding strict measures. Understandably, people are fed up. At the same time, there are gatherings and the you know festivals are back and things are happening. I mean, I've attended a few things myself where I may have been exposed. Um, and, uh, and it's, I don't know, I, I don't know what else to say. It is serious. And, and, and learning about some of the studies that are ongoing, it's really, uh, it really puts you in a difficult situation thinking about this because it's way beyond the individual's control. So I, I yeah. we hope for the best. I think well, I do have a question. I'm hearing a lot about if I, I don't know if this is a fair question about the vaccines we've, we've taken. Some of the people I personally am, am boosted uh, twice. So I've had four vaccines, but I'm hearing that this last boosters is not at all effective mm. in, um, in, the, in the current B4, B5. But we seem to be having a mixture here in, in certainly in Quebec. It's, we have all one, two, four, and five. I don't know. Mm. What happened to three? Nobody talks about a three, but it, it, floating around. And some people are saying, well, we're not going to take the vaccine until we're, or the, the booster until we're, we have a booster for the four and five. So I don't know if there's something that can be said about that. Um, so uh, I, I don't, I, I'm not going to try to give you an answer to that. Others may want to, but I'm quite keen not to get into a discussion on vaccines it's a very very muddled area uh, at the moment and um, uh, my colleagues in WHO are trying to work it through they can't give an answer to the kind of point that you're just raising now um, thank you, uh, thank you. I, I, I want to invite John Atkinson to make some remarks if anybody else urgently wants to speak before we go please grab my grab my attention now. We're going to stop very soon. John Atkinson, please. Yeah, so for me, what's, what's the implication for those trying to lead in a system where, where, where we've got multiple things interacting, um, multiple uh, activities, multiple perspectives? And the, the first thing is really what's to understand the pattern. What is the pattern that's taking place? Until you can see the pattern, you're gripped by it. You're gripped by it. You're just responding to it. You're not in a position to make judgment as to what the right thing to do is and you want to know whether it's amplifying or whether it's stable or whether it's decaying you want to be able to see that which means looking at it over some time so immediate responses are not always available or if we do respond immediately we may be simply acting to reinforce what's already going on but the key to it from a leadership perspective a system leadership perspective is understanding patterns as a collective activity what ray was talking to us about was huge amounts of data being worked on by lots of people you know it's not one perspective only and it sits alongside everything else and when we do that we are able to make much more intelligent choices about where to intervene 
And if we do that collectively, if the leadership activity is to bring lots of people into that discussion and have multiple perspectives trying to make sense of things together, then we've already created the impetus for people to move and to act appropriately. And we don't have to then try and convince them of our answer because they've been a part of creating it. So observe the pattern, notice what it's doing, get loads of people involved in trying to, in trying to fix it. And then you free up this, this thing that you've been saying all the way along, David, which is that people are the solution, not the problem, because they've been part of working out what it is that they need to do as a result of it. That's me. As always, John, thank you very much indeed for your commentary on what we're talking about. And um, so pleased. Um, thank you very much, Andy Pankhurst, for your comment on the independent SAGE discussion today. Uh, I'd like now to go to Mihika Acharya, uh, who's going to uh, take us through what will be, unfortunately, a closing session because our time is up. Uh, but also Mihika will tell you uh, when your plan is for our next session and also ways you can keep in touch between. Yeah, uh, thank you, David. And thank you everyone for attending. Uh, thank you so much, Dr. Ray, for sharing your expertise and also for Ga to Gawaher for attending despite having COVID. Um, I hope you feel better soon. So thank you for attending and thanks to everyone for sharing their stories, their experiences, their views as always. Our next OOB is on 15th July. Uh, and if you know anybody else who would like to contribute or who you think would benefit uh, or who would like who you'd like to tell this about this meeting too, please let them know and share the link. Um, and as everybody's invited, it's an open meeting and thank you everyone. So I, I also shared a narrative that we had just put on our website on mental health, climate change and COVID. Uh, and it's in the link is in the chat. I'd love your comments on that narrative. We're always trying to put these narratives up and uh, we benefit hugely from reactions. Thank you again, everybody, to my sister, Annie, with her husband, Keith, hello. I hope, Annie, you enjoyed the discussion of endothelial inflammation. I did enormously. Thank you for joining. <laughs>